I make reels and stuff that, that go viral sometimes, but I do it. How do you get to the point where you have an army that does it? I it's, it's one of those things where it just happens. It's like puberty, you know, you reach a certain stage and then it'll just begin to happen and you'll notice changes and you'll like get DMS, for example, Hey, I saw you on TikTok, And it's like, wait a minute, this is odd. Um, Cause I made a TikTok maybe three years ago. Cause I thought it would be a good like strategy to reach the youth, but then I hated it immediately. So I posted one TikTok and then I quit and I never went back to it. What'd you hate about it so much? Uh, I mean, the type of content's largely degenerate. There is a lot of really funny stuff on there, but you have to use it for a while to kind of like get the algorithm to know that you don't want to watch whores. You'd rather watch like, you know, racist memes or something. Yeah. So the first 24 uh, hours you have a TikTok account, you're basically just seeing like really hot 20 year olds dance like yeah. sluts. <laughs> which uh, I was not willing to make that investment, you know? So I, uh, I pretty much got off the app. Yeah, I understand. That's cool, man. I've been, yeah, like I said, I've been trying to figure out how to get an army to do that. Kind of like, that's one of the things that was so cool about Andrew Tate was that whole strategy that he had, but he built in like a real sort of MLM structure to incentivize yeah. that behavior. And it really worked. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how to do that, not just for me, but just in general, because we're coming up on like a really important election. And yeah. I think that there are a lot of people on the right who, feel really helpless about what they can do and even just doing shit like being a content warrior you know clipping other people's stuff whether it's your show or my show or Infowars or whatever you agree with yeah. um it can really make a difference man like the left is so much better at knocking and walking and making calls and harvesting ballots but we should be owning the social media space as much as we can yeah that's real I'm drinking a beer by the way hope you don't mind it's friday no not at all what are you drinking lone star are you in texas austin we could have met up in Waco or something. I'm up in uh, Fort Worth. <laughs> we'll get together sometimes. Sometimes I come up there and I hang out with Tim Young. Are you familiar with him? Tim runs his mouth. He's a funny guy on tw uh, I know that, Twitter. I know that. Yeah, I know the account. Yeah, he's good. He's a good dude. He's up there. You guys should get together. Actually, he does a really cool podcast. He just started with his fiance. I'll send you stuff after this. So, how did you um like get started in just the content space at all? I mean, there's so many people, especially young people, that don't want to get started in it because it, you know they want to be able to have a job. <laughs> Yeah, uh, man, I wish I had a moment that, that was like, you know, Chris Kyle watching the towers come down where he's like, I know what I need to do. It was just yeah. like I, I grew up uh, listening to, I guess, Mark Levin or Bill O'Reilly in the background of sure. my house. So I was like vaguely or instinctively right wing or Republican. Um, and then I started to get really into it during the Obama administration. But at the time, I mean, I was only like 10, 12 years old. So I'm reaching sort of my peak uh or my my plateau or cap in terms of how you know involved in it i can really get not only because i'm 12 years old but also because your brain is just so undeveloped i mean your concept of the world um it just needs to be so much more refined uh and so then when i got into high school it just sort of continued and then i had i told myself i think when i graduated high school that i wanted to like you know throw my hat in the ring and see if i could do because i thought i would have something interesting to add to the conversation. Um, if I thought that, you know, it was being sufficiently articulated, then I would have just stood back and stood by and I would have went to law school or something. But I did think that the uh, predominant like right wing media conglomerate was missing out on a lot that needed to be discussed. And so um, I took my subway nest egg and I bought a bunch of equipment and I started making content and then it took off uh, pretty quickly, actually. And I've just been doing that ever since. What year did you graduate from high school? 2018. Okay, man, you're a young guy. So I graduated in 2010 and I don't know wow. what your experience was, but my experience was in high school, nobody talked about politics. Like I was always a right winger. I was an Ayn Rand fan. My friends were probably left leaning. They were like, there were a lot of union kids, you know, sort of around, but yeah. like we didn't care. It didn't matter at all. Do you ever remember a time in your life where it, like it didn't come up? <laughs> Elementary school, maybe. Um, yeah. But like, I, I don't mean, know. I, I to this day do not know who my best friends in high school's parents voted for. Like, no yeah. Idea. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I guess since I I've reached the age of reason, so to speak, I don't have any memories of like, you know, social environments in or, or like in a middle school or high school. And, you know, it would come around every four years. Um, I imagine now it's much more proliferated because of things like black lives matter or the whole Roe v. Wade thing. I imagine yeah. now, like you can't escape it at all, but there was like every four years, you know, it would come up. And I remember during the Obama election in 2008, um, people were just asking, Oh, who are you going to vote for? Who are you going to vote for? Which obviously like we're not voting, but it was to say, who are your parents voting for? Like, who do you support? Right. Um, and I remember there were only a 
maybe three kids that were saying they supported McCain and I was one of them. Uh, and then there was, yeah, like two more, but I remember my teacher, Mrs. Gordon, she complimented this girl who had like an Obama pin that she was like wearing to school. Uh, this girl who was a problem child, frankly, I remember just like yeah. watching that happen. And I was just kind of like, this is really weird. I, why is she like, you know, supporting this person or whatever. Um, and then I got in trouble cause we had to do in my fourth grade class, we had a, a whole unit on black history. So we had to do a project where we pick a black person and we do a whole presentation pretending to be them. Uh, and oh, so I fuck. Chose... Did you do blackface? No, they literally stressed. So like on the little like paper, they had at least like three times. Like, do not do blackface if you are. Do not do. <laughs> so um, I chose to do Obama. And I told okay. my dad, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do Obama. And then he was like, oh, he started getting all, you know, boomer about it. He was like, oh, we're going to get you on Fox News. This is going to be you because he wanted to make it like a big like F you to the Obama administration. Right. So I'm like taking my notes and everything. I'm like, OK, this guy is like a rabble rouser over in Chicago, community organizer, drug mm. user, probably gay. And I remember when the first like checkpoint was we had to take 10 notes on our person. I remember Miss Petaway. I shouldn't be saying these names, but my fourth grade teacher uh, leaned over my shoulder and she was reading my notes and she was like, oh, well, we are going to need to like revisit this. And so we had to have like a meeting with my dad and everything. So then I was like, OK, I'll take it seriously, because my dad was still like, this will defend. I want to make this, you know, and my mom was like, no, he needs to pass. So my mom told me that if I got an A on the project, I would get to go to Zap Zone laser tag. And I was like, say less. Sorry, dad. Um, and so I did it. I did it well gave my Barack Obama presentation uh, for Black History Month, and I got a 95% on it, went to Zap Zone, got 800 tickets, and I bought a Krusty the Clown stuffed toy from the top shelf. And yeah, I don't remember sure. what you asked. Do you still have it? Do you still have Krusty Clown? We were just talking oh, yeah. about like politics coming up in school and how yeah. like my generation, just 10 years before yours, I mean, nobody gave a shit. Yeah, and, and so that's the thing too. Like we had kids that were like political kids. These yeah. kids are dorks these are the kids yeah, that like wear bag. the suit to school and they're like oh, yeah all their opinions are like really just stale and uninteresting yeah. i was more of like a, a troll where you know i i possess right-wing opinions but i really just kind of got off on like saying them to liberal kids in a way that not to like you know start something but like i'm not going to tell you that my most controversial opinion is like i want a 10 percent flat tax like i want to i want to push your buttons a little bit more with the way that everything's going in this country so that's why i wasn't voted like most likely to be president that was the you know the dorky kid i was voted most likely to protest because i was just always you know getting in people's faces about these things because by the time i got into high school uh because trump was running and so 2015 yeah he announces in june 2015 School had just gotten out and I'm back uh, for my sophomore year and everybody's talking about it. And I was like the only kid outspokenly in support of Donald Trump. Um, and it, I lost like all my friends uh, because that's that's not like a high status opinion. Like I was very popular. Everyone liked me. But then when you start to embrace low status opinions, you become like radioactive. Right. And so people don't want to be friends with you anymore. But yeah, I imagine now it's like impossible. And that's you saw this, too. I mean, during like 2020 everyone was posting the black squares on Instagram. Like you literally could not exist in any sort of social climate without demonstrating your support for the predominant narrative. Um, and you, when you were in school, I mean, I'm sure you never experienced anything like that. I really, I didn't have enough of a following then to do it, but I really tried to get the orange square going at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stand with president Cheeto. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, obviously Obama was controversial, but and the funny thing is, as much as I hated Obama, he seems like a saint compared to what we have going on right now. Do you, do you feel that at all? Like just I, I, every, he was corrupt and he was screwed up and obviously deceitful and lying about his history and all the stuff he did was terrible, but at least everything felt like it was getting better at the time, despite him. Now everything feels yeah. like it's falling apart. Yeah. I think that that's probably, um, it, it relies on like social capital that had already been built up. But I think Obama sort of wedged himself such that the uh, I guess the dam became more cracked. So I think that like the things that have caused our country to be the way that it is now uh, were more or less solidified during his administration. But it just wasn't as obvious to us yet, because, I mean, 
we're still in, being introduced to all this cool new technology and, you know, the culture is still relatively wholesome and, you know, crime is right. relatively under control. Um, you know, people still think that we can like, I don't know, go to the moon again or, you know, solve traffic or, you know, build. Antarctic and he killed Osama cities. bin Laden. You yeah, know, which yeah, I know he took out Bin Laden. Yeah, so it felt like we were like making progress finally in the war. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and now, I mean, it's obviously just a circus, and I don't think anyone thinks otherwise. Too, I mean, even the polling, uh, like eighty percent of the country at any given time thinks we're going on the wrong track. And the real black pill is that people will share that poll and they'll be like, look, a majority of Democrats don't want Biden to run. Look, majority of Democrats think that the country is headed in the wrong direction, even though their guys in office, these people believe yeah, but that, there. but then they will say, okay, but the solution is to put someone farther left into office or the solution is to, so they'll still like vote for the same people, but they're like, Oh, this guy just isn't doing it right. We need someone to do my like libtarded worldview the right way now. Um, and so they don't actually, it's not a win for us. Um, except for being able to like maybe dunk on our aunt at Thanksgiving or something. Yeah. I was thinking about John F. Kennedy earlier. Cause I've been messing around with some, some voice AI for some video content that I've been making. And there's a really good deep fake tool that you can use for his voice. If you want like a text to speech thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, you know, it's terrible that he was assassinated, but it's awesome that America at one point in time was set up in such a way that you knew who to assassinate. Like, yeah, I was thinking, I was like, would I ever assassinate Joe Biden? I'm like, no, I wouldn't change anything. He's not running anything. I don't even know who to be, to, who to assassinate. Yeah. <laughs> who do you think uh, is running the show right now? <laughs> I don't think there's one person, but it's exactly as you said. I mean, this is the problem with like democratic government. There's no accountability because no one actually knows who's in charge. So like, I mean, you can have like some king or some tyrant. If you want things to change, like, you know where he lives, you can you can have a revolution, you can have his uh, sort of cabinet, so to speak, take him out. Um, you can't actually have any sort of like regime change in a democratic system because nobody actually knows who is in charge. Uh, nobody actually knows who is making these decisions. And we have these like comfort rituals like voting or public opinion polling or primary. And it's like these are things to like solidify our sense of legitimacy within this whole process, but they don't actually do anything. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, like Biden's like a Walmart greeter at this point. I mean, you know, people just kind of flooding the, the country. I love you. <laughs> and he's like, hey, look at all these things. You can loot them. It's free. Who, who gives a fuck? It's like, he's not actually in control. Um, and I don't even say that like in the sense that like, oh, Bi oh Biden sees a freaking dementia patient. He's not in control. Kamala's running the show. It's like, no, neither of these people are running the show, obviously. If anything, it just vindicates how little power the president actually has. Uh, the reason things are so bad isn't because Biden's incompetent. It's because he's incompetent in the sense that he's not mentally present that he's allowed more control of the show to be uh, governed by the people who actually make the decisions. Because somebody like Obama, I mean, guy's still a political actor. He's still got an ego. He still has a worldview. He's going to have to negotiate with these people. I mean, he knows how the game is played, but ultimately he's right. still going to have some stake in it. Uh, same with like a Trump. I mean, obviously he's Trump. Uh, but Biden, I mean, he's literally just like whatever someone's telling him, oh, do this. Oh, OK. Oh, do this. Oh, OK. And that's why it's so bad. It's not like he's choosing. He doesn't know what the hell is going on. These people are choosing to have these things happen. And he is of no impediment to that. Um, and so it's just accelerating faster. Do you think anybody's actually explicitly running the show or do you think it's just the nature of large organizations when they reach a certain point that they sort of operate as almost like their own macro consciousness? And it's not really any individual calling the shots. So are we like run by a board of directors rather than any sort of actual executive authority now? No, I don't know. I don't think like people want there to be a villain, whether right. the villain is the World Economic Forum or the Jews. Uh, but it's like, I, I don't think it's that simple in the sense that yeah. like, these people operate as a class which is to say that they can count on each other more or less doing things that benefit them without having to be explicitly conspiring. Uh, and so there are certain things that benefit like the ruling class, whether it's mass immigration, offshoring manufacturing, uh, endless wars. I mean, these people don't have to like network with each other. And a lot of times they've raised their children to just believe these things. Um, it's not as though they are doing it maliciously. Perhaps like the incompetence is so extreme that it is malicious in a sense, but 
Um, I don't, th though I will say it does help our side to, because every, you know, mass movement needs there to be a villain. So in conversation with you, I'll be a little bit more uh, grounded, but if I'm doing something on my channel or I'm giving a speech or something, it's these bad guys and we need good oh, guys yeah. to I go I get them. about leftists all the time. I mean, it's right. intentionally ambiguous, but they're in, in all encompassing and I believe it, but it's also something you have to take with a grain of salt. Like who the fuck are the leftists? <laughs> like, yeah. You mean like the guy that voted for the Democrats? You mean Joe Biden? Are they even really left wing? And are they even different from the Republicans? Like it's right. just this broad sort of like, it's just like what the Nazis did, frankly, where, where they just sort of blamed everything on the Jews. And it was all the propaganda and all the messaging which was designed around just sort of categorizing every problems as their, as the Jewish people being culpable. Right. Mm. And, but at the same token, I do think it, I think it's the fucking leftists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? I mean, yeah, it is uh, because the people who do these things, I mean, by definition, they are leftists. So it right. is sort of like a broad term, maybe a little bit of a reflexive knee jerk, but it's also true at the same time. I mean, if you're advocating for things that are revolutionary, that are not conserving the country, that are like radical and unnatural, then yeah, you're a leftist. I'm going to give you an exercise to do and it's, very controversial. Okay. I want to dis I want to disclaim this exercise by saying that I am not a Nazi. I think that Hitler was an evil bastard and I disavow all of his messages. Okay. okay. That being said, if you take, if you buy a book of all of Hitler's speeches, mm -hmm. not Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf's boring and it's clunky and it sucks. His speeches are what actually got him to power because that's what he did to awaken the masses or whatever awakens the lack of a term darken the masses. I don't know, trick them, whatever. If you take his speeches and you replace every usage of the word Jew or Jewish or anything Jew related with leftist, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like in today's context. And that's kind of what I'm concerned about is like, as shit gets worse, the people are going to get more and more frustrated and radicalized. And we're eventually going to pin it on someone, whether or not, they're, they're culpable, whether it's a group, whether it's white people, whether it's the Jews or whatever, it's going to get pinned again. That's what happens when cultures collapse. They pin it. Absolutely. And, and there's going to be, we're going to have this huge power vacuum where there's room for somebody like Hitler. I'm not saying it's going to be some anti-Semitic, you know, neo-Nazi, but it would be someone that radical in one direction or the other yeah. that's going to come to power. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and both sides of the extremes understand this. The people in the middle think that we can kind of like vote our way out of this or own the libs our way out of this. The people who have done the reading seem to understand that we are within 20 years of mass graves. And at this point, we're just trying to figure out who's going to go in the mass graves and who's going to be digging them. Um, and if nothing That's changes... That's a statement, dude. That's a statement. If, if nothing changes. I mean, again, I'm not like happy about this. I'm terrified sure. of this, but sure. at the same time, I'm like, I'm not going in the grave. So, you know, we better figure out who it, but it's not going to be me. Um, and the communists, I mean, of course, they are very quite open about how they would love to kill conservatives, kill white people and put them in mass graves. And so what I would like to happen is if that if we get to that point where there is some radical figure, I would love it to be a radically right wing figure, because at this point, the system is so corrupted i mean the only thing that could change it is some like radical force i mean if you have like for example cancer cells you need chemotherapy i mean if you have you know lots of bacteria you need bleach like you need something toxic to get in there and cleanse the system to cleanse the government so say we have uh you you know you ascend to power you become a dictator or something am i really gonna like lose sleep over this idea of you like mass deporting all illegal aliens putting like you know the the traitors in the government in jail no i'm not you give one of those speeches but you're just saying the left i'm not gonna lose sleep over it however because it's true but what's probably going to happen is things are going to get worse the material standard of living is going to decline and it's going to be blamed on christians it's going to be blamed on white people conservatives yeah. um because it's this idea of progress i mean the hypothesis is so like metaphysically true that progress is good and if right now we aren't living in good conditions then the only thing that could be causing it obviously is those who are impediments to progress which are conservatives anti-progressives um, so yeah they're far more organized than we are um i just i probably if it gets to that point they're 
I don't know if it would be a communist. You might see something like an American uh, Hugo Chavez, but I don't think we're going to have some situation where, you know, there's like an American Caesar. I really hope so, because that would be great. But I don't think it's going to happen, uh, at least not in the next 10, 15 years. At some point, I do believe this country will correct itself because it's impossible for it not to. Um, but in terms of what we're going to see first, I think the the radical reaction is probably actually going to be from the farthest left uh, before it's from the right. Yeah, I think there's, I think that's all very reasonable. My concern about a correction is that anywhere in life where you make a correction, whether you try to lose weight, whether you try to get out of debt, whatever it is that you're facing, it's always really fucking painful to make the correction. You have to do like the work, right? You have to, as Jordan Peterson say, you have to make your bed, right? right? And so since things are so screwed up right now, I can't imagine how painful the healthy correction is. Like, all right, well, what happens if we admit that the dollar is worthless? Right. <laughs> you know, like, is it going to collapse totally? And then we start a new thing with a gold standard and like everybody loses everything, but what's, at least we fixed it and we restart. Like, it's going to hurt no matter what. And that's why they keep kicking the can because nobody wants to like get caught with, with their pants down when the, when the song goes off and there's no chairs to sit in, right? Nobody wants to be holding the bomb when it explodes. Yeah. And so I don't know. I'm, I'm just worried that even if we correct, it's going to be brutal. Probably, uh, but it's probably less brutal than what's going to happen if we don't, because yeah. if we don't, I mean, not only is the dollar going to collapse, you're going to have the country completely run by like criminal gangs and cartels. Um, and, and we don't really have like a military force or a police force that would be able to contend with that, whether because at that point they are underfunded or disorganized or because like our federal government who would be in charge of protecting American citizens is now pretty much hostile towards them more so than they all more so than they are already such that, you know, Oh, sorry, we didn't get the call in time. Oh, sorry. You know, like, like that, I mean, that's why they're shipping these people to red States. I mean, they want red States to have to deal with the consequences of mass immigration from the third world. So say, things reach a, a sort of, um, oh, what's the term in physics, a critical mass where you've got not in like a full, you know, dramatic Mad Max collapse, but you've got like chaos. Um, the federal government would ignore like red states being terrorized by criminal gangs and cartels to focus on, you know, oh, well, these poor people in the blue states, oh, well, these people, but like they wouldn't cover it in the media. Uh, it would be totally swept under the rug and they certainly wouldn't send immediately like federal troops or aid or anything to, to deal with that. It would be completely incumbent upon the states to deal with things like that. And when you're dealing with something as sophisticated as like a Mexican drug cartel, the only thing that could combat that is like federal police, the military. Um, and so, yeah, I think they're very happy to like allow things to get to that point. Do you think that we're going to have a civil war in this country and in the next century? No. Um, the reason for that is because like a civil war, I mean, when I think of a civil war, I think of like Syria. Um, our civil war was a war of secession and both sides had independent cultures. I mean, there was overlap, obviously, uh, they had a separate class of elites. There was like a distinct boundary. We don't have that. I mean, our boundaries would be like, you know, cities versus suburbs or more rural areas. Uh, but the problem is the right wing doesn't have any elites. We don't have any elites on our side. We've got maybe like Peter Schiff or not Peter Schiff. Well, yeah, Peter Schiff, uh, Peter Thiel, um, Elon Musk, maybe. I mean, you know, we've got like a handful, but in terms of like all the people with the power, they're all overwhelmingly far left. Um, and whether or not we like it, I mean, every time there's been a successful regime change or revolution or civil war, or whatever, it's always like been backed by elite support and institutional support. We also have no institutional support. We've got think tanks, we've got law enforcement, kind of, and we've got like, some part of the military. That's like the Nazis didn't have a lot of ins institutional support, though. Oh, they absolutely did. Hitler had allies within the the German military, within the German governments. Um, he had That's a, a true. Lot but when, when but when the Nazis first came to power and had representation, only one in forty Germans was a Nazi. I mean, that, they were well. That's like the whole like the whole population. Country. 
Yeah, right, right. So this is what I'm saying is <laughs> you don't need the mass movement. I see. Because I see. you need like the people who actually are in positions of power. Uh, you don't even need like all of those people, but you can have enough, which is why I don't think we'd ever have a civil war or some sort of like uprising because people pretty much go along with whatever's happening. Uh, it's it's really like a spectator sport between the people behind the scenes in these institutions playing tug of war. Um, and so that's good news in the sense that like if we could take those institutions back, we could avoid all of this. The problem is, will the right do that? Probably not, because there are so many barriers, whether because of affirmative action or like cancel culture. I mean, even motivation. I mean, the average right wing guy who's up and coming is much happier to, you know, go do his own thing. Because that's the other thing with conservatives, like physiologically or, or psychologically, we don't feel obligated to actively work to conserve we kind of take things for granted right we Whereas were the, reactive too yeah like we're trying to protect something that already exists rather than like fuck it up or make something exactly. new. exactly and so we just left, sit and wait for the left to do something all the time yeah, they're miserable and so they're playing black and to, chess you know literally yeah they they're very happy to make their entire life's mission like destroying america just because they hate their dad and so you've got like some say 125 IQ white guy who is conservative and he could, you know, go work at some institution, climb the ladder, be a competent political figure, but he'd rather go work in finance or he'd rather go, you know, clerk at a law firm or something like that, which is almost like you can't blame them. You can't fault them. I mean, it sucks sure. that we are collectively in this position. However, we're still in this position. Somebody's got to do it uh, sooner rather than later. So what's fascinating to me though, is like, typically when you look at the history of revolutions, they come out of like a, a desperation, right? So when you look at what happened, for example, in Germany, unemployment was 30%. They had the hyperinflation problem and then that radicalized the people. And then countless other examples throughout history, it's been like that. But mm -hmm. in the case of the United States, when we had our civil war, like it wasn't a particularly desperate time. The South was just like, fuck you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you were just like totally unique. You know, I, I, you know, we still have our houses. We still have our property. We can still put food on the table, but fuck you. Like yeah. that is Admirable. the audacity is insane. Admirable. The Southern spirit. Yeah. And, it yeah. will and like, I'm again. not a racist guy. I don't believe in slavery. And you can argue all day about whether the war was really about slavery. And I don't want to get into that, but I do respect the Confederates for just being like, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, here's like, I don't know if this exactly switched my opinion. I was never really like pro union just because I, maybe I sure. wanted to be edgy or something. I noticed like all the libtards were like glorifying the union and Abraham Lincoln. So I sort of had like, he a was a racist bastard. I sort of had like a speeches. I, I sort of like had a friend enemy moment where I was like, wait a minute, if the liberals like Lincoln, okay, I guess that puts me on the other side. So um, I read some figure that, the Confederate soldiers, upwards of like 90% of them could trace their lineage back to before the founding. With the no Union shit. soldiers, it was like 40% because they had all these oh. Ellis Islanders coming over and fighting. And so, you know, obviously I'm not pro-slavery at all, but there is something disturbing about seeing how the Union literally leveraged mass immigration as a war strategy because you've got all these guys who are like, hey, here's a rifle. Want to go kill Americans in the South? Oh, sure. And, you know, now these people yeah, are- Yeah, we'll give you citizenship. Exactly. And you kind of wonder, like, could that happen again? Could they expand the foreign legion? Because you've got these people coming up from Latin America, from India, all these. Yeah, but when like, was the last time the, the United States won a fucking war, dude? I think I, I don't think they are necessarily trying to win a war geopolitically, but I think that the military now uh, would be very happy to turn rifles against its own citizens with like the class of people who currently occupies it if it came to that point. Yeah, but the last time the U.S. won war was when Don Geyser wore this fucking helmet, bro. <laughs> I got one of them back there, too. I know, that's why I threw that. I was like, oh, cool. So what's the story of your shit on the wall? Uh, well, this is an authentic 1945 M1 Garand. Um, all the... How much are the rounds? Oh, dude, they're like... Uh, maybe four bucks a round? Two dollars. Two? <laughs> if you get the original like M2 surplus ammo, uh, they're pretty expensive. But yeah, all the metal is original. The furniture is new. Um, but yeah, beautiful rifle. I've actually, I've got two of them because the one was for the old set. And then I thought I would leave that set there in Michigan, move down here to Texas and have another set with another rifle. Then that didn't end up working out. So now I just have two of them, which I'm not going to complain about. Um, sure. and this is the bayonet, of course. That is a helmet. Um, that's not authentic. That's a replica. But yeah, just, you know, general World War II nostalgia. Can't go wrong with uh, with that if you're trying to appeal to the right. Dude, yeah, it's awesome. This is my uh, granddad's K-Bar too. 
Oh, that's the, awesome. In the war military issue. I don't know what year, probably 43, maybe 41. I don't know. He was in the whole time, but it's a cool knife, man. It's yeah, great it's for opening knife. boxes. <laughs> he was opening up Japs with it and you're just like, Ooh, Amazon. Yeah. And I don't want to misrepresent him. I don't think he was actually in combat, but he was in the oh, Navy okay. at the time. He was a tugboat captain. So he would go, I guess they would like shut down the major carriers and ships a lot to be mm -hmm. more discreet and the tugboats would pull him through enemy waters. So he was the guy that would like tug him in and out of, I don't know, very, but I don't think he was ever saw combat, hmm. but he still signed up. <laughs> so, um, what do you think is going to happen in this next election election cycle? Um, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Like I, obviously I support Trump and I, I think he could win. I think he would obviously win if it were fair, but I don't know that enough has been done about the fortification uh, since last time. And I, so I don't know if he could actually win again. I don't know if any Republican could ever win again nationally um, if they were running on, you know, actually conservative Republican issues. So I don't know. And I, I don't even know if Biden's going to, you know, I guess they'll have to run him again. He announced he was else. running. Yeah. And I guess they're going to have to. Um, I am very interested by... Uh, RFK Jr.'s candidacy, though. I really think it's a flash that, in the pan. Maybe, probably, but I don't know. He is at least elevating issues to the mainstream that are very important. And he yeah. has like a refreshing display of agency. Like I hear him talk and it's like an actual person talking. It's not like, you know, some comms director's speech that's being written. It's like, or being read. Uh, he's right. like an actual person with like thoughts and a history of actually just not doing so for, you know, public benefit, but just doing so because he has like a fixation on it, um, like advocacy for these things. And so he talks a lot about how our country is literally poisoned by our food and water supplies. That's a huge issue. I mean, that contributes to why people are leftists. I mean, leftism is really like a biological phenomenon in the way that it exists now. You've got all these people who are depressed, spiritually ill, dysgenic freaks. And there's a reason like all the Antifa mugshots look the same. Like these people are not healthy. And a lot of that is because the hormones are uh, completely messed up from endocrine, disrupt endocrine disruptors in the food and the water, the pesticides, food packaging, shampoo, toothpaste, I mean, everything. So he's talking about that. So is he going to win? No, but I saw something like 24% of Democrats were in support of his candidacy, which probably is because they're nostalgic for the Kennedys. Can't blame them. I got a little nostalgic, honestly. It's like, you know, another Irish Catholic in the White House. Let's go. But um, it's at least good because it does present the opportunity for the base to shift on those issues, meaning that like you won't be able to be taken fully seriously if you don't address those issues in the future. Is that likely to happen? Maybe it remains to be seen, but it's definitely a net positive so far, at least. One of the things that's interesting to me about the RFK phenomenon is never in U.S. history, I believe, has a U.S. presidential incumbent been unseated in their own primary? Obviously, we've had incumbents that have lost to the opposition party's candidate. But mm. the fact that RFK is getting so much press as a Democratic candidate, even though the press is negative, the fact that he's getting so much attention is astounding to me. Like I can't even remember the name of the guy who ran as a Republican against Trump in the primary the last time when he was running as an incumbent. Right. And so it, the, the fact that the left is pretending that there's so much support for Biden is obviously incompatible with what we actually see happening in terms of Democrats running against him as yeah. the presidential incumbent. Yeah. And I'm really glad it's a Kennedy too, because I mean, look, this guy's still a Democrat he's still a liberal, but he is good on a lot of issues that now, because of the way things have evolved would be actually he's, like, he's right just not a me. fucking liar. Like, yeah. I don't care if somebody, I disagree with somebody, just don't be fucking corrupt and terrible. Yeah. Like, and well, I mean, he's probably a little corrupt. I mean, he is a Kennedy. He does have a little bit of a, we'll say colored history, but in a way that's like kind of cool, honestly. But he's our like, corrupt guy, man. Like, yeah, he's exactly. Guy. He's an American, <laughs> damn it. Like he's not, he's not selling out to some foreign national. He just yeah. wants to have sex with hookers. All right. He's a <laughs> Kennedy. Who cares? It's in his blood. <laughs> that's awesome. So if you, if you ran against Trump, would you vote for him? Uh, I, would vote Trump. I would vote Trump yeah. over Kennedy. Me too. But uh, if With, I would vote Kennedy, Kennedy over DeSantis, it's though, it's well, not impossible. I would vote Kennedy over DeSantis. You know, I probably would too, but I don't know why. Can you yeah, tell just, me why? Because Kennedy's just it's my intuition. Just hands, my yeah, intuition just raw, 
raw instinct. Don't be some nerd. Like I'm going to look at the policy. No, no, just be like <laughs> that guy. He look. I like what he. I like what he's on about. What do you? Uh, what do you think of DeSantis? You think he's full of shit? Obviously, he's doing a good yeah. job in Florida. Yeah, I've been calling out DeSantis for two years now, and when I first did it, I was nervous, and then you know people gave me crap for it, but it's been totally vindicated. I mean, the guy is whether or not he likes it the force that the pre-Trump establishment GOP is using to try to undo Trump's revolution. It really was like a revolution in terms of how he shifted yeah. the entire political climate in this country. Um, and yeah, and I think, he, Frank, I mean, he's like 40 something. If he wanted to be the guy, all he would have to do is wait four more years. Say I endorse yeah. Trump. Trump would be like, wow, tremendous guy. And then Trump would campaign for him after he's done. Yeah. The fact that he wants it right now shows either a terrible, like, lack of judgment because that's like political suicide obviously uh or he's like actually a bad person he's like just grifting and trying to undo what trump has done i mean this is the guy who in 2018 when he was running for governor had a whole advertisement that's message was look how much i love trump i'm like reading my kids books about the border wall and it's like okay is this guy really like going to carry the torch or he's is he just a guy that kind of goes where you know he senses the tide going because when he was in congress his voting record suggests he's pretty much an average republican then he needs to win a race in florida he gets on the trump train when trump's in the white house trump endorses him then he beats andrew gillum and it's like i don't know so um at this point yeah i'm i'm pretty much anti desantis yeah, I decided I was going to vote for Trump. I was on the fence for a while. I was like, maybe it would be healthy to have just, you know, somebody that's a little bit more palatable for everybody in office. It, maybe it would, you know, heal some of the wounds and the div divisiveness that we've experienced as a nation. And then I realized, no, fuck these people. I want to vote for whoever the left hates the most. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, these are the same people who called George Bush Hitler. And I mean, it doesn't matter who the guy is. There's always going to be you know, this is Hitler and the like sort of media, like the baggage, for example, I argue in my Trump video properly understood just means whoever the establishment perceives to be the biggest threat. Like the reason your aunt hates Trump isn't because he's actually like a terrible person. It's because all she hears on The View and MSNBC is Trump did this, Trump did that. And then they, you know, they dig it up and okay, like he maybe got a little creative with his taxes as like a billionaire real estate developer. Oh, who cares? Maybe he paid hush money to a porn star. Who cares? Like, I'm not saying I love Trump because he's just been so faithful to his wife. I love Trump because he's going to, like, take out the illegal immigrants. You know, he's going to bring back the jobs. He's going to make America great again. So you can't get around the, you know, the the pain, the hurt. What is it? The, the hurt box, I think they call it. Anybody who's legitimately transgressing against the way our system works is going to have baggage because the media is going to convince everybody that. So if they aren't doing that because or to Ron DeSantis, it's because they don't actually perceive him to be a threat. Now, you are going to have like liberals working in, you know, Vice or Vox or BuzzFeed who are like genuinely off put by DeSantis because they think he's like a fascist or whatever. But in terms of like top level media executives saying cover this person negatively, you're never going to see something like that with DeSantis because he's not actually a threat. I mean, yeah, he's good on the culture war stuff. Yeah. You know, he passes good bills in a you know state that is red with significant red majorities in both chambers of Congress. It's like, OK, you know, cool. Very impressive. Um, like you're like the best governor out of a whole country of terrible right wing governors. And people are like making you out to be like the next Trump. Like Trump literally ended several American political dynasties just by being funny. I mean, he changed the party attitude on immigration Only on foreign Obama. policy. Yeah like insanely talented political figure. The fact that people are even comparing DeSantis to him is illiterate. It's it's like actually not to be, you know, pearl clutching, but I'm actually offended by the comparison just because of how exceptionally talented Trump is. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's one thing that, that really did astound me about the left throughout Trump's president, presidency. It was the arrogance in terms of how they incessantly underestimated him. So yeah. Barack Obama, just to make a counter example, not somebody that I would vote for, not somebody that I like, or I'm, I'm impressed with as a, as a leader or a politician, but someone I would never underestimate as an incredibly talented political figure. Right. right. And the whole time, like the left couldn't, the left hated Trump so much that they couldn't even admit that, th that he was kicking their ass in a lot of ways. And yeah. I think that's, that's why they got walked all over in 2016 when everybody thought Hillary was so certain to win. And the whole time he's like, I got a way. My guys tell me there's a way yeah. you know? and it made it happen. Right. And yeah. I don't know. I just, I, I don't see a whole lot of humility from the left and maybe the right suffers from this too, but 
I don't know. I just, I think that's a major problem, but I want to ask you next about what you think about the media. Cause you mentioned the media a lot and mm-hmm. it's something that I've done countless times throughout my content creation in the space. But when are we going to just admit that the corporate media doesn't fucking matter anymore? Like I'm mm. looking at the numbers of the ratings and their viewership and my podcast certainly doesn't get as much views as Fox news or CNN, maybe as much as MSNBC, but like there are so many podcasters, not just Joe Rogan who get way more views, way more engagement than any of these mainstream outlets, whether it's New York times, whether it's the wall street journal, yeah. whether it's CNN, like the, they don't matter anymore, but like they have this like legacy brand, you know, right. it's like Coca-Cola where they like, people think, Oh, it's reported in this. Therefore it's, it's, it's like this appeal to authority fallacy. Therefore it's legitimate. Or this is what the, 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 the establishment is trying to say, but like, shouldn't we just stop even caring what they say? Because no one fucking watches them or listens to them or reads them. Yeah. That's the problem. It's like you said, with the legacy brand, they've also got this nest egg that they can use to, for example, like lobby big tech companies to prioritize their coverage over independent creators so yeah. people stop watching legacy media because it sucks it's boring i want to see what independent people are saying youtube exists now you've got all these people who are big on youtube talking about politics talking about news and then you know these companies see that that's where things are going and so they you know use whatever nest egg they have to now okay well now we're going to be the approved sources and you can still access these independent sources but they're not going to be shown to you you're going to have to right. seek them out um, at your own accord so i would like to see that happen but i don't know i'm a little pessimistic on that because and the problem is too especially with us a very significant if not the most significant portion of our base are like baby boomers and baby yeah. boomers love their televisions. I mean, they yeah. love them. But Virtually, there are guys like us, man. There are guys like us. True. I mean, we're uh, we're in the minority, though, definitely, uh, with our generation. For sure, but so we're the Nazis, bro. This is what I'm talking about. We're just <laughs> like the Nazis. Baby, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, yeah. and I noticed it's like... I, I get frustrated when people are like, I'm being shadow banned because nine times out of 10, when people say they're being shadow banned, it's just because their content sucks. They just suck. Cares. Yeah. <laughs> right. However, yeah. I will say that I use YouTube and every, every major media platform. And I frequently have videos that get 200,000 views on TikTok. I post the same exact short on YouTube. It gets 200 views. Yep. And I don't know if it's because I've had too many strikes on my account throughout the past, but it, and they all have different algorithms that are proprietary that, prioritize different things or different platforms with different audiences. But it, it, you start to wonder when, okay, why is this video going viral on TikTok and Instagram, but no one's seeing it on, on YouTube. I posted it at the same time with the same captures with the same hashtags. Right. Why is that? And I, I am concerned about some of the shadow banning that I see on these mainstream platforms to your point. And they, they definitely prioritize CNN. I mean, if you type in Alex Jones on YouTube, to like look for a funny reel or clip or compilation 10 years ago, you'd see all everything you wanted. It was yeah. hilarious. Now, like all you see is coverage about, you know, the, the litigation that he's going through for like pages and pages. You have to go to rumble to even yeah. find anything, you know, and I, I cut Alex Jones clips a lot. So I have a hard time finding clips that aren't just some talking head at CNN bitching. Yeah, it's so unfair and like annoying. I mean, I hate that they're rigging the, if they acknowledged it and they were like, you know, we have to yeah. rig the game. And I guess they do kind of, but I don't know. I just hate how they claim to be so committed to democracy and, you know, majority rule, but then they censor all of our ideas. That's why all of the most like zero regulation areas on the internet are always like the most right wing because yeah. our ideas win. I mean, every time right wing ideas have gone up against left wing ideas throughout history, right wing ideas always win, which is why they have to like just kill us because they never can actually win the debate because it's just everything they believe is a lie. It's fueled by resentment because they're like losers who can't compete in a hierarchy. So they instead of making themselves more competent, just reject the whole idea of a hierarchy. Do you think leftism really started with Marx or does it go way back? Oh, I know. I mean, this could go back to, uh, yeah, <laughs> before Marx, uh, maybe even the French Revolution. I don't know. I, well, I mean, literally, I, think, I, think I guess back to Rome, bro. I, yeah, I, I guess like literally, uh, you know, where we get the left from is after the French Revolution, where, you know, the, the people who sat on the right were the monarchists and the people who sat on the left were the uh, the revolutionaries. So um, but yeah, it could go back to Rome. I mean, you would definitely see these trends throughout all of human civilization, but uh, in terms of where the current strain began, maybe I would say the French Revolution. 
Have you ever done any research at all into the uh, assassination of Caesar? Have you ever actually read about it other than the fact that he got killed by all the senators? Uh, no, no. Red pill me on this. Dude. Okay, hold on. Can you, do you have a second? I want to be conscientious of your time. I promise we'll be done after 15 more minutes. But if you, even if you go to the Wikipedia, I'm going to share my screen and actually read this with you. Um, it's, it's really amazing how similar what happened to him is uh, to what happened to Trump. So obviously they, they haven't physically assassinated Trump yet, but in every way they possibly could without actually taking his life, they've basically done the same shit, right? So I'm going to go down to the assassination. I think there's a, I think there's a Wikipedia page dedicated just to the assassination of Trump or not Trump, excuse me, of um, Julius Caesar. Yeah, here we go. So obviously the senators conspired and it was a real small group because they didn't want it to leak that they were conspiring. Several senators in, um, after the fact were disappointed that they hadn't been included in the conspiracy, right? But they just wanted to keep it really tight. They planned the thing for months. But the crazy thing is after they, after the senators stabbed him to death, um, it says here, I don't know if you can see. I'm going to skip down to right after what happened. He was killed. Yep. Dictator's last words at two Brute. After the assassination, Bruce stepped forward. The aftermath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, fuck, man, I got to find it here. The senators ran through the streets and said something to the effect of, you know, people, yeah, people of Rome, we are once again free. So the people knew something happened. They locked their doors because they were scared that there was something mm -hmm. going on. And the senators, Brutus and his companions, marched through the city announcing, people of Rome, we are once again free. They were met with silence as the citizens of Rome had locked themselves inside their houses as soon as the rumors of what had taken place began to spread, Right. Wow. So the senators thought the people were going to be all stoked about it. And they were like, what yeah. the fuck? And then if you look at the aftermath of what happened, a crowd amassed expressed their anger at the assassins by burning the Senate house. Two days after the assassination, Mark Antony summoned the Senate and managed to work out a compromise in which assassins would not be punished for their acts, but all Caesar's appointments would remain valid, right? This was supposed to be the compromise. And when they did, when they had his funeral, and this is well-documented, the people were so pissed off that they threw their furniture and belongings onto the funeral pyre because he was cremated and it almost burned down the forum. Like wow. this was like a situation where, where Caesar was like their Trump. He was like this populist guy who came in and just eradicated the corruption that existed. Obviously he was a dictator, which is a problem in and of itself, but it takes a dictator to sort of eradicate this just bu bureaucratic corruption that the Senate had amassed over centuries. Right. right? And, and they loved him. He hadn't done anything wrong yet other than piss off the political class. And they were so disappointed when he was assassinated. Like we think of it as, oh, you know, this is the first assassination of a tyrant by the representatives of the people. It's like, yeah. if you read the history, everybody was pissed off at the senators for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, like these like political nerds who write the history books, uh, they're always going, oh, Caesar, he was a dictator and these noble senators. And it's like these people, I literally, I wish I could find a less crude way to describe it, but it's masturbation. I mean, when these people get together and they like talk like this, they're literally just like participating in this circle jerk of just like, oh, you know, democracy and politics and good statesmanship. Like you should be, you should like actually be killed. Honestly, like you should be killed for saying stuff like that. Like it is so stupid. It, it violates my pursuit of happiness when people say things like that when people say things like that it is so stupid that it actually makes me a danger to myself which in a way means that if i kill them for saying that i'm standing my self ground defense. it's self literally self-defense like this i would love to like argue this dude, dude, <laughs> that is a fucking can of worms in a, in a court of, in a court of law <laughs> your honor the person said our democracy one too many times yeah no i can't stand these people yeah, words are words are violence. They're, if words are violence, that means that I can kill you if you say something that I feel is a threat. True. Right? True. Yeah. Oh my God. So anyway, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. I really enjoyed talking to you. It's nice to meet you. We should definitely get together sometime since we we only live a couple hours away from each other. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh thank you for having me.